Good morning, everybody. We're just uh, uh, waiting for people to join us and we'll get started shortly. Well, I think we're about ready to get underway. So first of all, uh, welcome. And uh, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet before, my name is uh, Chris Kilford. I'm the president of the Canadian International Council branch here in uh, Victoria. So welcome to our members, our guests, and of course, Jonathan. And we are glad you could take some time out uh, of your busy schedules to join us today. And we are recording this event for those uh, uh, folks, our members who cannot be with us this morning. Before we do get underway, I'd like to recognize that CIC Victoria members, uh, we live, we work, we learn on the unceded Coast Salish territory. And we give thanks to the Lequengan uh, people who are now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations for allowing us to meet on their traditional lands. And I am um, sure that there are a few non-CIC members here today. And for those of you that aren't familiar with CIC, we are an independent, nonpartisan, uh, membership-driven think tank, and we just love engaging Canadians on um, international affairs. And I think what makes us a little different from many think tanks is that we now have branches across the country in 18 cities. And you can certainly find more about CIC Victoria by uh, Googling us. Just put in CIC Victoria, and we are on uh, Facebook. And if you ever want to join CIC Victoria, please reach out to us. And you can contact me at uh, my email address, which I'll, uh, I'll put into the chat a little later on. So in the interest of time today, because we have a lot of ground to cover, we're not going to dig into our biographies. That's me and Jonathan. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Jonathan, if you don't already know, is the author of the bestseller, Claws of the Panda, Beijing's Campaign of Influence and Intimidation in Canada that came out in 2019 and also Restoring Democracy, which was published last year. So the way we plan to tackle things this morning is that I have some opening remarks that will just sort of take us back on a, a little bit of a journey to see um, what sort of foreign policy our, our previous governments, we won't go too far back, but we will go back to Pierre Elliott Trudeau, what kind of foreign policy uh, documents, white papers and so forth have come out in the past. And then I'll provide a little bit of background about uh, foreign policy by Canadians, this uh, de deliberative democracy exercise that we undertook uh, earlier this year, the largest ever held in Canada, because I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, how did all of that work? So I'll talk about that. That sets the scene, so to speak. And then uh, I have a series of questions that I'm going to pose to Jonathan about uh, the findings from foreign policy by Canadians. And then afterwards, we'll have ample time for Q&A because we are going to go until 11.15 today. So let's, uh, let's start by delving into some of the historical uh, background. And uh, when he was asked to define Canadian foreign policy, Lester Pearson was reported to have said, ask me at the end of the year. And when I look back at what Canada has done, I'll tell you what our foreign policy is. And so with Pearson's quote in mind, there's no question that the speed of world events can easily result in very carefully developed foreign policy statements becoming quickly outdated. Nevertheless, uh, foreign policy white papers and the like are meant to be solid statements of government intent. And they're not without their benefits because they do force governments to conduct a critical examination of current policies and make course corrections if needed. And there have been times when the Canadian government has taken the time to produce overarching foreign policy statements. And one particular example we have is back in 1970, when Pierre Trudeau's government unveiled a foreign policy called Foreign Policy for Canadians. And that's where the inspiration came for our, our deliberative democracy exercise, which was called Foreign Policy by Canadians. Now, in his particular case, uh, a general booklet was accompanied by separate studies on uh, how Canada should look at Europe, the Pacific, Latin America, the United Nations, and international development. And two very significant outcomes of this period 
uh, was our scaling back of contributions to NATO and establishing diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. And some of you may even recall back in 1972 when external affairs minister Mitchell Sharp published his third option, which proposed increasing uh, Canada's trade with uh, Europe and Japan as a way of reducing our dependence on the United States. Now, after uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, we had Brian Mulroney's 1986 white paper, Canada, Canada's International Relations, and it argued for active internationalism, and it provided the conceptual basis for our uh, unilateral leadership in, uh, uh, against apartheid in South Africa and promoting human rights in Africa in general, in China and elsewhere. Um, besides focusing on our relations with, uh, with countries around the world, it became important for us to build that relationship with the U.S. to continue building on it, and we uh, successfully pursued a continental free trade agreement um, in 1988, followed by the North, North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994. Now, in 1995, moving forward, uh, Jean Chrétien's government released Canada in the World, and it had three foreign policy objectives, the promotion of prosperity and employment at home and abroad, the protection of our own security within a stable, within a stable global framework, and the projection of our uh, values and culture uh, overseas. When Canada in the World was released, however, it became quite infamous for leaving Great Britain off the world map. Uh, that was em em emblazoned on the front cover of, of the document. Now, I'm sure many of you will also remember uh, Team Canada delegations led by uh, Prime Minister Chrétien when he took business of executives and officials overseas. And um, we were very heavily involved in, in selling ourselves, our goods and services around the world. And it was also a time that uh, we saw Foreign Minister uh, Lloyd Axworthy coming to the forefront with his human security agenda. In 2003, then Minister of Foreign Affairs Bill Graham issued his paper, A Dialogue on Foreign Policy. And in 2005, uh, Paul Martin's government released a five booklet set collectively known as Canada's International Policy Statement, A Role of Pride and Influence in the World. But it didn't survive for very long, as I'm sure you know, because by 2006, we had a new government in power. And that was Stephen Harper's government. And Stephen Harper's government uh, didn't publish a foreign policy white paper, but did issue the 2008 Canada First Defence Strategy and the 2010 Statement on Canada's Arctic Foreign Policy. It's also a time, though, that Canada made some very decisive foreign policy decisions, for example, taking a, an active role in Libya and Syria, closing our embassy in Iran, reducing and eventually removing in 2014 our military presence in Afghanistan and placing sanctions on Russia after the invasion of Crimea. In the end, the Harper government simply chose not to have a foreign policy white paper tying everything together, and perhaps that was simply because events were moving so quickly. In the end, Prime Ministers uh, Trudeau, Mulroney, uh, Chrétien, Martin, and Harper all wanted to put their own mark on Canada's foreign policy, but none fundamentally changed the basic objectives of protecting Canada's security, safeguarding our economic interests, and maintaining Canada's fundamental freedoms. Now, moving much closer to today, in 2017, and just prior to the announcement of uh, Justin Trudeau's government's new defense policy, Strong, Secure, and Engaged, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, Christian Freeland, did deliver a speech in the House of Commons that focused on foreign policy uh, priorities. And events were moving also very quickly in this period, but uh, we did see the Trudeau government conclude three major trade uh, deals inherited from the Harper government, and they were the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with the European Union and the Canada-United States-Mexico Agreement, or new NAFTA, if you like. So despite comprehensive defense and aid policy reviews, plus significant new trade agreements, the current government did not seem, uh, did not appear to see the need to conduct a full-scale foreign policy review to potentially recalibrate um, Canada's national interests. And it's something um, that we believe in CIC that, that uh, should be done uh, in the future. And we hope that by our effort through foreign policy by Canadians, that whoever forms the next government will be prompted to do so. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but we've certainly put a lot of effort here into uh, looking at the future. Now, what about foreign policy by Canadians itself, this deliberative democracy exercise that we spent a considerable amount of time uh, thinking about, putting it together and actually making it happen? 
So earlier this year, the CIC with the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health and Global Canada brought together the largest representative sample of the Canadian popula population ever gathered to discuss and debate a number of important Canadian foreign policy questions. Over the course of some, on average, 10 hours, 444 Canadians of all ages and backgrounds, representing nine provinces and two territories, deliberate, deliberated online in, in small groups and heard from various export experts in very, very lively plenary sessions. And they were focusing themselves on how Canada should address issues associated with global public health, security, prosperity, and human dignity. Think of it, if you would, as one big Zoom conference with plenary sessions, breakout rooms, time to think. Um, indeed, 39 breakout rooms in all, with an average of 10 people in every one. And it was quite something to see because I was able to peer into them without them seeing me from time to time and listen to the discussions. And, and it was a, a remarkable experience to be a part of. Now, I should also add that this deliberative democracy exercise was conducted in both official languages, that is, in, in the case of the breakout rooms, and facilitated by Dr. Jim Fishkin and his uh, world-renowned deliberative democracy team from Stanford University. And I'm sure some of you are wondering, how in the world do you get 444 Canadians together uh, in, in one sort of place on a Zoom platform? And it was challenging, and we had to do it in two separate sessions. So we brought a large group together. Uh, over a weekend, and then another large group together over four evenings. And these 444 folks were selected by the polling company YouGov, who have a large uh, stratified uh, um, uh, sample of the Canadian population who belong to them or they know about. And they reached out to them and uh, gathered together the sort of set of folks that we wanted to see, a very diverse uh, group representing all Canadians. And in order to ensure that 444 Canadians actually showed up on the day, uh, we did offer them a small honorarium of, of essentially $150, so that it was a little incentive to, to take part. Now, for example, uh, among the participants, the distribution of income was a factor, ethnic diversity was a factor, and we ended up with a group that was broadly representative of the Canadian population, 74% white, 11% Asian, 6% black, and 3% First Nations, Inuit or Métis, who took part. We had a lower participation uh, from, from the French side of things. Uh, only 14% of the population uh, identified as, uh, as uh, French Canadian, uh, lower than the 23% of, of what we were hoping to have. But um, this overall exercise started with the 444 being brought together and um, giving, uh, given 75 questions, the polling questions that they were asked to answer. And then over the course of those 10 hours or so, they talked about all of these issues, these world issues, and then they were polled again to see if their thinking had changed as a result of the discussions that they were a part of. And that was quite something. And one of the first things that we recognized, one of the first, well, the first polling question they were asked um, uh, before they got together to speak was how poorly or well would you say the system of democracy in Canada works? And before deliberation, 69% of the 444 people thought democracy was working well. But afterwards, after we polled them, uh, after the 10 hours, 80% said the system of democracy in Canada actually works well. Once they had a chance to talk about things, see uh, how Canada works internally and internationally, they came away with a much better feeling, a better understanding of, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these issues. Now, we also asked other key questions, and I just want to mention a couple of them. One of the questions they were asked was um, in the polling, um, you know, should Canada focus on paying down the large debt we have accumulated during the pandemic before we try to have greater in international influence? And 72% of the 444 were in favor of this before deliberation, but that dropped to 67% afterwards, where um, here we felt the shift was a slight one, but demonstrated some recognition amongst the participants that despite our growing national debt, Canada still had an important role to play overseas. And on trade policy, for example, support for the proposal 
Canada should adopt a policy of prioritizing trade agreements with democratic countries that respect human rights and dignity. Actually, that dropped from 88% to 79% after the two days that, you know, the 10 hours we spent with people. Now, this was quite a large shift and in, in an unexpected direction. And we felt perhaps demonstrating a somewhat resigned view that there was little that Canada could do to change the behaviors of some countries, whereas trade was um, important for Canadian livelihoods. And if you were in the rooms listening to uh, people talking about these issues concerning trade, bread and butter issues were central and other international issues such as human rights around the, the globe, while important, uh, as we could see from this polling, uh, tended not to be so much afterwards. Now, if there are any diplomats in the audience, I'm sorry to have to tell you that when we asked if Canada should increase the number and size and resources of embassies in the around the world to promote our national interests, 68% uh, were in favor of that before the 10 hours, and that dropped to 58% um, after deliberation. And again, it came down to bread and butter issues uh, where Canadians felt that uh, we should be focusing on uh, issues at home rather than uh, what's happening abroad. And of course, that's not the way things normally work. And quite a number of people in these discussions uh, did say, well, hang on a moment, um, during COVID-19, the, uh, the embassies and consulates that we had around the world were absolutely critical in getting my family members home. Uh, and, and so I'm not so sure about this. Um, but anyway, always interesting to ask these uh, questions. So in summary, why, why, why did we do this? Why did we undertake foreign policy by Canadians? Simply put, uh, we felt that in a world with uh, COVID-19 to climate change, rising international powers and more and more complex foreign policy challenges that we needed to really think about this and impress upon the government or whoever's in power next that they also need to put more emphasis on foreign policy. Now, why? Because, well, look, a less than a generation ago, uh, for example, many believe that great poli politics, great power politics was a thing of the past and that um, increasing um, interdependence with China would change its human rights uh, record. There wasn't a lot of debate in the, in the academic world in 1985 about, the, about what the US should do in a post-Cold uh, Cold War world because you know, we few imagined that the Soviet Union would, would ever go. And like I say, we were aware that foreign policy is never a hot topic in this country. And if you simply look at what's happened since 2004, we've had six federal elections resulting in four minority governments and just two majority ones. No federal political party has managed to rally, rally more than 40% of the voting uh, electorate behind it. Another federal election is just a few weeks away. And when it comes to our foreign policy since the year 2000, so over the course of 21 years, we've had 14 different foreign ministers in this country. We also sense that there has been a noticeable decline in Canada's international presence. Our diplomatic corps, for example, is disillusioned and our aid budget continues to languish. We've lost two consecutive bids for a UN Security Council seat. And we're almost totally absent when it comes to UN peacekeeping missions. And relations with some of the key players around the world, uh, such as China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, have reached new lows. And we've also just witnessed the dreadful developments taking place in Afghanistan. Now, it's not all gloom and doom, that's for sure because we are a significant power on the world scene. And I know we like to call ourselves a middle power. Look, we have the 10th largest economy in the world, and we are actually the 13th highest defense spender in the world, which I think would surprise a lot of people who often think that we are hardly doing anything on the defense file, but we are in 13th place. We're one of the world's biggest energy suppliers. We are a society that is free and as fair as any on earth with one of the oldest functioning democracies. And we continue to be a beacon of uh, freedom to people everywhere. So for CIC and its partners, Canada's foreign policy matters. And that's why we embarked on uh, foreign policy uh, by Canadians. And so now what we'll do is I'll stop talking. I hope I set the scene and I'm gonna talk, uh, turn to Jonathan today. And I have um, six questions for him. Uh, they won't come as a surprise because we have had a chance to speak beforehand about these questions. And what we're hoping to do is sort of pull the best out of, out of this whole exercise, explore some of those issues, 
and then turn it over to you for Q and A. So, uh, Jonathan, welcome. And Dude. the first question I have for you um, now, and we know as this exercise was taking shape, there were two global and overarching issues that Canadians were contending with. Uh, first of all, uh, we had the disrupt disruptive Trump presidency, but it was in the rearview mirror, but only just. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was in its third wave and uh, numbers were quickly rising across the country. Now, do you think that in the absence of uh, a, a Trump administration, and if we had not been in the middle of a pandemic, the, the overall results that you saw coming out of this, uh, of this uh, uh, exercise would have, would have been any different? Well, first, Chris, thank you for your uh, uh, charge over a lot of heavy ground very quickly and good, great pricey of uh, where we are today. Um, and I think in, in there, there's a, lot, um, there's a lot to be proud of, isn't there? There is. Um, but on your question, as you said, uh, and as we all know, a, a poll like this is really just a snapshot in time, and it's inevitably influenced by the events of the day. But also, as you said, that there are you know, three fundamental themes running through foreign policy um, and, and through, uh, through this survey, and they are, they are you know, national security, they are the economy, and uh, they are the defense of our civic values. Um, now, uh, the, the priority, the order of those three will change according to, to our circumstances. And so will the, the relative importance of those three. So you can have a whole uh, combination of, of results um, just with, with those three central themes. Um, I think, yes, if you did that poll today, yes, it clearly would be different. Um, I think that there was a high expectation after Trump's defeat and um, uh, the uh, election of, of Biden that um, United States policy would uh, return to what it had been before. And that hasn't happened. It hasn't happened for several reasons. Um, uh, one, I think that, that Biden appreciates very strongly that a lot of the driving forces in the US at the moment are its internal conflicts, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the horrendous polarization, not only of politics, but of society. And um, he seems to be trying to address some of these things. He seems to be trying to put the US back on a sound base, particularly on its economy and its infrastructure in particular, which is, nothing's much been done to, uh, to sustain its, uh, its infrastructure since the 1950s. Um, and so he's turned, uh, he's turned away from the outside world. And we've seen that, of course, very dramatically in Afghanistan uh, in the last, uh, last few weeks. And, and that, of course, you know, raises questions for Canada. Um, I've noticed over the last few days, the, uh, some of the European countries are beginning to talk about um, uh, revisiting uh, plans which uh, have been on the table really for 20, 30 years about a united European force and, and uh, uh, military force. And that's based on the notion that, um, uh, that European and uh, uh, US uh, views of NATO are diverging uh, quite significantly. And, um, and Afghanistan and other, uh, Afghanistan was certainly a, 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 a picture of that. Um, whether whether the European Union will will uh, uh, shunt aside NATO and um, and uh, create its own uh, military force uh, is hard to tell. Um, they haven't been very successful so far because it would require a far more political integration than many of the countries are willing to to uh, to uh, think of at the moment. And of course, they've just lost the, the, the most um, the most effective military force with Brexit and the departure of the British. So it's a it's a different equation from what it was a little while ago. But you know, but that all raises questions for Canada about Canadian security, which um, come perhaps more um, more to the fore than they were when uh, when this survey was taken. And that one can you know, there are many many questions arising out of COVID, which uh, get more intense as as uh, as the pandemic continu continues. So um, I think yeah, we would there would be different emphasis if we did the same poll today. But but 
but the, the central themes of, of security trade and, and sustenance of our civic values, those, those are always the same. Um, and, uh, but I think perhaps that you know, sustenance of our civic values is going to be far more important than perhaps is indicated in this poll. We'll, we'll come to that in a little yeah, while. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Jonathan. The second question I have is, mm -hmm. uh, and this one is closer to home, because the participants, they, they demonstrated overwhelming support for a more prominent presence in Canada's Arctic, and they were very concerned about the increased presence of countries such as China and, and Russia in the Arctic. They were um, keen to discuss how Canada can assert its rights and find other strategies to defend the Arctic, uh, noting that Canada's military needs, needs more funding. But the, the devil is always in the details, as, as we say. And um, could you, for example, uh, if you had those 440 people here today, uh, what would you suggest to them a prominent Canadian presence in the Arctic might actually look like in, in the coming years? Well, it, it's, a, it's, it's a central question, but it's also a broader question because it, it brings to the fore and carries on from something we were talking about a few moments ago, but that Canada is now far more responsible and has far, uh, far more need to defend its own sovereignty than it has had in the past. You know, the, the Arctic has looked after itself for a long, long time, but the prospect that the Arctic is going to become an important international seaway means that we Canadians have to be prepared to police it and uh, prepared to defend our sovereignty, but also to uh, ensure that, uh, that it is used in a way that we want. For example, um, you know, the environmental issues of passage through, uh, through uh, the Northwest Passage and so forth. Um, uh, Northwest Passage is disputed territory with us in the United uh, States. I mean, uh, this has never been fully confronted. The, the, the Manhattan went through there in what, 1960s, early 1970s. Um, and there are all sorts of submarines from various places going around under the ice up there. But uh, uh, with global warming, we are going to have to have a significant presence up there to establish our, uh, our sovereignty and our policing of our waters. Um, we've got a whole load of, um, of uh, Arctic patrol vessels um, coming into service now. We need more than that, I would suggest. And I think here's an example of um, where our um, interests can overlap. Um, we do not have ice capable submarines at the moment. I'm not suggesting that we need nuclear submarines, but we need uh, submarines that are far more capable than the, the, the job lot of used and rusting stuff we got from Scotland a few years ago. I would suggest that um, uh, getting new submarines, we look at the Japanese models. The Japanese um, uh, diesel electric submarines are some of the, if not the most uh, advanced in the world. And uh, um, doing a deal with the Japanese about um, uh, buying some of their submarines would establish us uh, not only as, as able to secure our sovereignty in the Arctic, but it would also be a very potent signal to allies in Asia that we are serious about, um, uh, about uh, contributing to uh, security amongst Asian democracies. Um, could even get us into the Quad, the, uh, the, uh, the security um, alliance between uh, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia. Um, so you know, there are, there are there are ways of, of addressing some of these issues that can, uh, that can, that can fall under a number of headings. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And as we watch geopolitical rivalries flaring up around the world, as they always have, of course, but again, we're in a new, new, we have a new crop of them. We asked the 444 if some sort of new alliance was needed, you know, an alliance of liberal democracies to defend the international rules-based order. Um, but there was only very lukewarm support when it came to discussing this, you know, with um, people around the tables uh, saying that uh, you know, the existing organizations like the UN, the G20 and NATO, they were sufficient, uh, sufficient enough to keep uh, geopolitical rivalries from, from boiling over. I wonder if 
if uh, if that's the case uh, with you, do you do you think we need some sort of new alliance, or can we rely on the old institutions to see us through? Well, it's, it, institutions like this are organic, aren't they? They they, they either they either live um, by their own merit, or they or they wither, or they become inconsequential. Um, I mean, it's very clear, I think, that the United Nations needs serious reformation to 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 meet its uh, uh, the, the vision of it going from 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, how that is achieved, I have no idea. I, um, uh, and, and while the, uh, the five original nuclear powers still have veto power, um, it's not going to happen. And I don't see any of them giving up the, uh, the veto power. So I think you know, the UN has its, has, its, um, has its uses and it's, it's very efficient at some things, but it also uh, it, uh, it, um, fails to satisfy on many, many uh, occasions. And I, that's where we have to have other more regionally based or, or theme based organizations. I mean, I think the G20 is a, is a very useful forum and that is a you know, Canadian creation. Um, I think that uh, the CPTPP uh, in terms of Canada's relationship with Asia uh, is going to be very important. That is important uh, because it is a, a trade agreement that also incorporates civic values into, into it, the way it operates. Um, I think, as I've just mentioned a few moments ago, it would be a good idea for uh, Canada to uh, do what is necessary to become a member of the Quad, make it the Quint, I suppose. And there'll be others as well. Other countries want to join as well. Um, I think the um, the truth of the matter is that in terms of, of demonstrating our, our 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 commitment to Asian security and and security amongst uh, uh, the middle power democracies of Asia, we do not pull our weight on the on the security front. You know, we, we do fairly well on the on the economic and uh, on the political front, but on the security front, we don't. And um, we need to uh, we, we need to be far more present on the security front in Asia. Um, we've already you know we have very workable and, and beneficial trade uh, free trade agreements with uh, with uh, the United States and Mexico, and we also have free trade agreements with several countries of, of Latin America. Um, we have an excellent free trade agreement with the European Union, uh, but we need to uh, we need to to put political um, uh, political power behind behind some of those. And I think that we do need to uh, really look seriously at developing. Uh, uh, some form of alliance amongst middle power democracies, because uh, the the pressures from within and without on uh, on middle power democracies are only going to get worse uh, and more uh, potent over the next few years. I would submit. Mm -hmm. And this ties into to the the next question I had, and it, it revolves around trade, and it can be tied back to Mitchell Sharp uh, looking for a third option, trying to diversify away from the the U.S. And despite our best efforts, uh, we weren't really able to do that for for a lot of a lot of good reasons. And even today, in the discussions that took place amongst the 444, this question of being overly reliant on the U.S. Uh, came to the forefront. And of course it would have, because we were in COVID, there were questions, we, well, we still are, but then of course it, it was more of a shock. Supply chains were failing. We were not able to get, um, we were not able to get vaccines. Connecting here. Vaccines became an issue. And um, another, other um, uh, PP, personal protective equipment became an issue. So this whole business about relying on the US was at the forefront and people were saying, well, you know, can we, how else can we diversify away? Well, we've got lots of trade agreements, that's for sure, but is it realistic? I mean, can we, can we do any more to diversify our trade or, or do we need to look internally? I think a question that, that the people had coming out of the, of the discussions was, you know, should we... Add Sorry, you've frozen there. Um... Chris, for a moment, I missed just the end of what you said. <clears throat> have you fr have you frozen? Have I did. I'm sorry. Yeah, just some problems with the internet today. But uh, okay. uh, well, but... 
I, mm. I think I got I got the just um, you know we, we we have the curse of geography. All, all all countries one way or another have a curse of, 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 of geography, and ours is that that we live. Uh, we are a much bigger country than the United States geographically, but we have a tenth of their population, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we are going to be dependent, uh, ultimately dependent on trade with um, with the United States for for as long as the, the sun rises, the, withers, the rivers flow, and the, the grass grows. Um, that's the truth of the matter, and uh, but you know that all gives us an opportunity to diversify. Um, and as you say, we've 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 done reasonably well at that. We 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 um, you will know my hobby horses. We became overly fixated on trade with China in the last 50, 60 years, and that we should have um, paid far more attention to other countries with, with whom we shared values beyond uh, an interest in trade. And that's I'm sure as a result of the Huawei affair is going to happen, um, especially uh, as we see. Uh, Xi Jinping really starting to do in China what Putin did to the oligarchs in, in Russia uh, 15 years ago. Xi is doing the same thing. He's essentially renationalizing the whole economy um, and making sure that none of the oligarchs uh, in China are a threat to his, his power. And so we're going to have to roll with that and, and, uh, 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 and uh, carry on diversifying. But I think you know, the, the COVID has raised really some very, very serious questions uh, about um, weaknesses in our country generally. And one of them, as you say, is, um, uh, is uh, um, uh, our inability to, to produce what have turned out to be quite strategic um, uh, items of one sort or another. And I think that one of the things that we ought to be doing is as we hopefully approach the end of COVID, is is really assessing what are, are what what constitutes national security in Canada these days. The the, the breakdown of the supply chain was extraordinary, and, and how swiftly it happened, and uh, how it has continued. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, and you get one large container ship blocking the Suez Canal, and the whole world comes to a screaming halt. It seems. Um, you know, we, we need to reassess what it is that we need to be able to produce in Canada uh, to sustain our country through emergencies. And um, it's clearly a much greater, a longer list than we would have thought three years ago. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of other lessons from, from, from COVID, which we can talk about at another time. But, but in terms of, um, of international affairs, I, I, it, it really uh, does force us to, to I think, reassess uh, what constitutes uh, uh, national security in Canada. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that's ha happening, and I hope uh, the politicians uh, come to grips with it after the election. So, one of the things that we also discovered during our, our uh, roundtables and, and breakout rooms with with our four hundred and forty four was that there. There was a lot of support for for aid, international development, uh, in support of things like uh, Canada's feminist uh, foreign policy. Uh, although I have to say, people were mindful of us not going around and imposing our uh, cultural uh, norms on others and and uh, telling them telling them what to do, and if we're not invited, not to go. So that was very clear. Um, the, uh, the the people around the tables also felt that Canadian companies should um, uh, operate according to Canadian rules when it came, comes to the environment as well. There was a lot of um, interest in engaging ar ar around the world, although arguably this reluctance to see more embassies runs against the current. Um, but when it did come to funding these sorts of things, giving more money for international aid and, and an international presence, there was quite a, a, a well, a fair bit of, of reluctance. And it seems to be a, a, a Canadian trend from time to time. And it's not new because we've watched the foreign aid budgets languish for, for many, many years. What do, you what do you think in your mind um, is going on here? Canadians want to be engaged, but they don't want to be engaged, if it, especially if it involves money. Well, I think that may be, um, the result of so relatively few Canadians seeing what happens at the other end when the money arrives or doesn't arrive um, at, at, the, at the destination. I mean, I I, I have a, 
a fairly hot-headed view on this whole thing at the moment. I think that we have the most massive uh, development aid uh, uh, project to complete at home in, in dealing with reconciliation with our native peoples. Um, it is something that has been allowed to languish and go on for far too long. And I think before we start sort of playing you know, Canada to the grass huts in a, around the world, we need to, to get our, our, uh, our, um, our, our, our uh, we need to get our, our home um, settled. And it's, uh, this is a project which uh, has, has been allowed to languish for far too long. I, I remember when I, I covered Ontario politics in the 1970s, there was a problem with mercury poisoning at a place called Grassy Narrows. It, uh, the mercury poisoning came from a, from a paper mill. Um, uh, the people in the, in the village of Grassy Narrows started getting uh, uh, mercury poisoning minimatis disease, which affects the nervous system. A uh, friend of mine, uh, uh, Graham Hutchinson of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, George Hutchinson of the London Free Press uh, wrote a superb book about it, which was published in 1978. Nothing has been done. Nothing has been done. The situation there is as bad as it was now. We have all these villages and towns across uh, northern Canada in particular, where the, the, the water is not potable, where, where um, uh, there, are, there is no fundamental uh, economy worth a damn, um, where education, housing, everything else uh, needs attention. And we need, we need a... Um, uh, a new uh, commitment to to Canadians of all heritages, and it seems to me that um, uh, you know uh, we are being hypocrites. We are being hypocrites of the worst sort if we don't recognise the, uh, the, the 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 development program that on our own doorstep we need to do before we go preaching to other parts of the world. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, and in fact. Um, indigenous issues uh, were, were front and center uh, around the tables in, in many discussions. And that was a, a constant theme that people did bring up, that we have issues at home uh, that we haven't dealt with. And that was before the residential uh, school issue uh, uh, with, with, the, with the children came to our um, renewed attention, let's say. So um, I'm sure if we'd asked this question again, the focus would have would have been very much in, in a line a, along what you're, you're thinking. Um, the final question I have for you, uh, other than a quick a couple of other snap questions that we talked about that I would throw at you, is um, you know, uh, Canadians around the table amongst the 444 spoke about many things that they worried about. Uh, they were worrying about worried about the integrity of our elections and, and foreign interference. They were worried about uh, cyber criminals and state surveillance and censorship. Uh, worried that we were falling behind other countries in transitioning to uh, oil and gas and to to a clean uh, energy economy. Uh, a lot of a lot of concerns. And I'm I I, I wondered if if what you felt about uh, this. You know, do Canadians really have that much to worry about? Yeah. They do. I mean, I think all these all these things you mentioned and others are very serious uh, threats to our political and social order. And I, I don't think that we have quite grasped it yet. Um, uh, you know, but, but our, I don't think that our uh, political system and our political culture, if you like, at the moment, is quite fit for purpose for what is going to come at us. Um, and uh, we need to be paying far, far more attention to and, 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 and reassessing our democratic system, how it works, um, how effectively it works. Uh, and um, uh, you know, some of the, the cultural, uh, 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 some of the cultural attitudes that have, have seeped into our our political culture, the political way of working, which I don't think um, are fit for purpose in the, uh, in the, in the, in the years to come. Um, you know, we, we're seeing even in this election, um, you know, we now have gravel throwers uh, as, as part of our political process. We have a lot of deep-seated anger in our political process, which never used to be the case. Um, where does this come from? Why is it there? What, what, 
why are there all these, uh, this maybe obviously a, a minority of people, but why do we have all these people who feel disenfranchised? And we've seen this in Europe, we've seen it in the United States, um, uh, amongst our, our, our fellow democratic countries. And we've sort of imagined that we're uh, immune to this sort of thing. We clearly aren't. We clearly need to look very closely uh, at what is happening in our society because there are a lot of people who one way or another feel that uh, the uh, institutions of state, or the uh, institutions of power in this country do not represent them and do not understand them. And um, that is a recipe for disaster. So we need to look at it very closely and very quickly, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And so I do have some, uh, as we spoke about earlier, some quick response questions, but I wanna actually hold off on those. And I, for the audience listening today, um, we we have in, if you look below at the bottom of the screen, there's a, a Q&A function there where you can type in your, your questions. And if you do have them, please do, and we will, we will get to them. And I do have one there, Jonathan. So I'm gonna start with questions uh, coming in from the audience before I tackle you on a number of other issues uh, surrounding this de deliberative democracy exercise. And this question has come in from, from Diane, who's a CIC Victoria member. Hello, Diane. And uh, now Diane is asking a question that I'm probably the one to answer because, uh, I've been involved with with uh, this exercise, and it's a question about the, pro the the whole exercise of foreign policy by Canadians. And did any political leaders ask for your report results, uh, such as um, Mark Garneau or 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 Aaron O'Toole? Uh, did they know about this exercise? And, and that's a great question. You know, this is a process that started uh, back in uh, well, where are we? It was earlier this year, I guess, or no, sorry, last year. Time has really really flown during COVID. We, we uh, gathered uh, folks together to talk about this exercise uh, within the CIC family uh, as to how we would approach it. We um, held a number of branch events uh, focused on international trade and, and uh, um, human security. And we tried to say to ourselves, you know, if you are going to bring 444 people together, what are you actually going to talk about? What are you going to discuss? because there's so much to discuss. And so we tried to refine what it is uh, we were doing. And we um, kicked off a lot of this uh, with the Minister of um, uh, International Development uh, giving an opening address at an event that CIC Ottawa ran. And uh, CIC Ottawa was also very good about bringing together um, uh, the foreign policy critics of various parties, um, uh, also as part of this overall effort. And we had, um, all the good intentions of the world of going around and, um, and briefing political parties on the results of foreign policy by Canadians. But we are, as many of you know, a small organization who undertook a monster project and we never got to it uh, by the time um, elections were, were called. Although I do know that our uh, president, Ben Rosewell, was able to go and brief Global Affairs Canada on the findings of foreign policy by Canadians. And at one point, we were almost hoping to hold a foreign policy debate with the political leaders, but but uh, again, things moved quickly with the election, and we weren't able to to pull it together. So, um, as to the awareness of this exercise, people are 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 very aware, uh, but that's always uh, you know that's good. But then, how do you actually move forward? And I think once the election is over, whoever happens to be in power, uh, it'll be a great opportunity for us to. Uh, uh, engage and talk about this report. And we're already thinking to ourselves, we should do this again. We should take another snapshot. And this should be part of the regular um, Canadian foreign policy discourse. Uh, we do know that political parties uh, engage with Canadians when they are thinking about putting together white papers and so forth. That does happen. But this is like an independent group, uh, the CIC, uh, um, um, owing nothing to anyone, um, and we we were able to do this, and we think that we should do it again on a more regular basis. And we learned a lot about how to do it better in the in the future. So thank you for that question, Diane. Could I and just Jonathan, please put, put a PS on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I think an indication of the uh, steep hill we have to climb is that we have uh, tonight. Uh, 
uh, the, um, um, uh, the leaders' debates in, in French. And uh, of the two major debates in English and in French, it, the international affairs policy, international policy is only being debated in French. Um, and well, fair enough, but, uh, but I think that that uh, indicates that uh, 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 we still do have a lot of uh, work to do to convince uh, Canadians beyond our, our membership that um, uh, because we are a, a, a middle power trading nation uh, dependent on relationships with other countries, that, that, uh, that to a large extent, the, the well-being of our own lives in Canada depends very much on the strength of our international relationships. And I'm not sure that we've, we've convinced uh, Canadians of that yet. And we, we have, and it's undoubtedly a message that needs to be reinforced with every generation. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there were two, two things that struck me um, as we were talking. Um, one, for those of us that were involved in this um, foreign policy by Canadians effort, and especially when we did get people together, is that, you know, Canadians, bless their hearts, are busy. They have families and their children that they have to get to school. Um, some people struggle just to get uh, food on the table, uh, which, which we, often, we often forget. Um, and so in some ways it was surprising um, uh, how much on the one hand uh, Canadians know about foreign policy and on the other hand, how much they don't know about foreign policy. And I, I think it's there that the, many uh, governments feel that they can get away with not talking about foreign policy because it's just not high on the overall uh, radar. And you got that sense in some of the, in, in the breakout rooms when people were discussing um, issues of great importance, but really just have a very, very basic knowledge of, of what is really, really happening. So that was one thing. And the second thing is exactly what you say with foreign policy. If um, you, you look at the political parties right now, um, the conservative uh, platform, of course, is, is quite lengthy. Um, I don't want to get into discussions as to how it can be, is it affordable or not? That's not what we're here to discuss. But what I would say is that China is mentioned 41 times in that uh, uh, policy platform, Russia as well, Iran and, and the conservative government, um, uh, or, sorry, the conservative party uh, have uh, laid out quite a number of foreign pl policy platforms uh, that you're not seeing elsewhere. Um, so, so, you know, obviously there's, there's room for discussion on all of these things. We'll just have to see what happens after the 20th of September and, and we'll engage uh, from that point forward. I, I have a question from Paul here in Victoria. And um, Jonathan, could you comment on the, the, the Canadian uh, UK option regarding the uh, alliance of liberal democracies, um, in, a case, in this case, focusing on the Commonwealth? You know, we, in the Commonwealth, we, we share political, cultural and security interests. Um, uh, we also have five eyes, of, co of course, but is there, is there anything to be built on there with the Commonwealth? This always comes up, doesn't it? And uh, there's there's always a lot of affection for, for the Commonwealth and the hope that it could be more than it is. Um, it's such a diverse and disparate group of countries these days whose only um, fundamental link is that uh, three generations ago, um, they were all part of the British Empire. Um, but they are, they are so different and diverse these days that I don't think that the Commonwealth as such um, is a, a, a useful forum around which to try to build a, an international uh, association of, 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 of democracies. A lot of them aren't democracies anymore. You know, I lived for a long time in Zimbabwe uh, when I was Africa correspondent and um, uh, you could hardly call Zimbabwe a, uh, a democracy by, by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination mm -hmm. these days. And there are several other countries, uh, not just in Africa, but elsewhere, which uh, are still part of the Commonwealth, but um, which one would hesitate to call democracies. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
I think that we, we need to be far more stringent in our classifications and, and to look elsewhere. Um, so no, I, I don't see the Commonwealth as, a, as, a, as an actual carriage for, uh, for that kind of ambition. I have a question from Paul, and it's in an area that you'll be very familiar with, and that's the uh, concerning the, concerning the two Michaels. It's mm -hmm. been more than a thousand days. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe there'll be a decision soon on the um, extradition issue that we're facing. Um, uh, what's your opinion on how this may play out? I am afraid that uh, the kidnapping of the two Michaels was intended by the Chinese Communist Party to give us a lesson, and not just us, other countries in the world as well, that goes well beyond the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the case um, uh, that uh, Meng Wanzhou, uh, the Huawei financial, chief financial officer faces about extradition to the uh, United States. This has meant to be a warning to not only us, but all other um, uh, liberal democracies that you don't muck with the, 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 the red aristocracy um, in, the, in the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and so I'm afraid that they will, whatever happens to Meng Wanzhou, and the, there remains the possibility that the, the, the judge in BC will decide that um, uh, there is one way or another no case for her to answer in the United States or that the, the process has not been uh, fulfilled properly and that she is, um, she is freed. I think that even if she is freed, the Chinese Communist Party will hang on to the two Michaels for a, um, an amount of time that they feel is appropriate to get the lesson over to us that you don't muck with the Chinese Communist Party because that's what this is all about. And um, uh, I, it's, it ought to be a very, very uh, serious lesson to Canada and other countries about how they deal with Beijing. And um, we have to have an economic relationship with them. We can't avoid that because they're, they're probably the second largest country, uh, economic um, uh, power in the world and uh, may well overtake the US if they haven't already done so. So we're going to have to have an economic relationship. But I would suggest we keep it strictly transactional. That um, uh, you want to buy uh, Canadian natural resources, send us an order, send us a check. When the check is cashed, we'll send it to you. And I think that that's about the most we should seek to achieve in our relationship with Beijing at this, mm. this uh, point in history. It, it does tie into a question that I have from uh, Lynn Hunter. Uh, Lynn, thank you for your question. And it is about what to do with the relationship with, mm -hmm. with China, because it's more than the two Michaels, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's, it's the whole okay. issue with Uyghurs, with Hong Kong, with Taiwan. Um, mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. And as yeah. you say, it, it just transactional what about things such as tourism and and the uh chinese students and and so forth um is that transactional it, it, what do we expect out of this well i think you know all these things i think that we need to reassess what we've got ourselves into because you know, as set out in the book clause of the panda you know we've been delusional to a dangerous extent over the last 40 50 60 years about our relationship with, with beijing as you referred to Earlier, we've 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 had this notion that um, that uh, if we made uh, the Chinese Communist Party a, a stakeholder, to use a word used by an American uh, diplomat, uh, in um, all our institutions and in our economy, that they that would change their political view of the world and it would lead to political reform. That's not going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. We've learned that, you know. The, the benefit of the Huawei affair, the benefit of this crisis in the relationship with Beijing is that it has shown us that um, we cannot have a normal, broadly based relationship with the People's Republic of China. We share no common values with them. Yeah, we can have a transactional relationship, tourism, fine. Um, keep selling them the stuff we've been selling them since Alvin Hamilton did a deal with Beijing in 1960. We're still selling the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they are not nearly as important to our economy as the um, agents of influence uh, for Beijing here in Canada try to convince us. 
the, the Economist, I think it was, did a study about a year ago or so of uh, the international economies uh, that were dependent on, um, on uh, exports to China and it ranked the countries according to their dependence on their exports to China. Canada is 47th on that mm -hmm. list. We don't depend on what we sell to China in any significant way at all. Mm -hmm. Um, we become dependent on buying stuff from China because that's where most of it is made these days. But that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that can be dealt with by diversity. But, but in terms of what we sell, we sell them basically the same stuff we sold them in 1960. It's, it's right. meat, it's grains, and that's about, and ores and timber, and that's it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, that uh, we... We need to reassess it. Well, I think we need to look at the whole student business from a slightly different perspective, um, because we're now at the point where uh, one or two of our universities, and the number is probably growing, have become uh, um, dependent on those inflated tuition fees mm -hmm. for foreign students. And it's not just from China, from other countries as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the whole business of, of, of uh, economic dependence on foreign students generally, not just China, is a serious question that our, our, uh, our uh, colleges and universities need to be addressing or, or be, be pushed into addressing because it's, uh, there are some real dangers here. Thank you for that. One of, uh, I'd like to just return to a question that Paul had earlier because we spoke about the Commonwealth. We know the challenges that the Commonwealth have and, and we're, of course we're members of the Francophonie as well. But there's, uh, you know, this whole there's a tie also to the UK, uh, a relationship that's there. Uh, we see our friends in Australia having to face off against, um, uh, you know, Chinese uh, intimidation coming from Beijing, for example. We have New Zealand, who who's uh, a longtime friend. Is there anything to be said for countries like the UK and Australia, New Zealand, um, trying to forge deeper ties to work closer together? Well, I think that already happens. That's you know we were talking about sort of organic organisations, organic relationships, and uh, and that clearly is an organic one. I mean, with, as things stand, even though uh, you know we are all, and including the UK at this point, we are all uh, immigrant countries. Um, we do have that, uh, that foundation of, of, of a common uh, common cultural and political heritage, which. You know, may get eroded over the next half century or so, but which at the moment is is there and uh, and is functional. And um, uh, you know, when we when we when we when we talk together, we 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 fundamentally we have a fundamental understanding of where we are all coming from. Um, you know, there's an interesting and this doesn't this doesn't refer to to, to those countries, but there, there was an interesting I think um, equivalence in the way in which immigrants into Canada from Hong Kong were able to relatively quickly acclimatize and feel at home in Canada. And that was because the fundamental institutions of authority in Hong Kong, the fundamental approach to the relationship between the citizens and, and the administration was same in Hong Kong as here. Um, now, you know, and that's why one can see a, a very different um, uh, paradigm uh, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, immigrants who come to Canada for, from other countries where that, re uh, that uh, relationship between power and the citizen is not the same. So yeah, there is, there is that very simple, basic day-to-day -day cultural link between us and, and Britain and, and uh, Australia and New Zealand and other countries and other countries as well, um, that, um, uh, that, that sustains those relationships. Um, uh, and, and I think they carry on regardless. They don't necessarily need a, an institution beyond you know, five eyes is, is, uh, is at the heart of, um, of government security in all our countries and, um, uh, and uh, you know, sustains a level of connection at the government level, which... Uh, which is, is mirrored also in people-to-people -people relationships. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came out from foreign policy by Canadians was this uh, rising belief in democracy after everybody had gathered together and had a chance to meet one another and 
and and and talk about issues which uh, which was as I said earlier remarkable to see. And I do wonder now though if we brought those uh, people back together again, how they would how would they see the developing political situation in in Canada? And this ties into a question that Hamid has uh, asked. Um, and hello, Hamid, out at, at, with CIC in Ottawa. Um, it's about ordinary people being disconnected from the, the democratic systems that we've all become familiar with, that, that the leaders are somehow not representing what the people have uh, uh, at the forefront of their, of their thinking. And we just saw, for example, um, Prime Minister Trudeau have to come face to face with uh, a handful of gravel. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we've seen anti-vaccination protests that have become quite... Uh, um, uh, well, they've been very robust, even here in Victoria. So, is this a is this a case? You know, if we brought these people back today, that they would start to they might have a different view of of democracy. Um, are are we are are our leaders out of touch? I think they are. Um, I looked at this a fair bit in, in in my book, restoring democracy, and I think that one of the uh, I will there are a number there are a number of problems, but. I think that one of them has been that the political parties have lost touch with uh, the constituents. You know, my family and I, we've been, we've been back in Canada from, from Asia since 1998. So heaven knows how many federal, provincial and municipal elections we've had in that time, 25 years nearly. Not once in all those elections has anyone canvassed at uh, our door, not once. Mm. Um, politicians don't seem to canvass anymore. There's this huge reliance on polling. Um, and uh, uh, I think that in the, in the, in the political sphere, this is, it, has, it has disengaged many, many politicians. Uh, or, or as aspirant politicians from the citizen. They rely on polls. They don't rely on going around and listening to people. Um, you know, one of the advantages of the poll that, or the, the, the study that you've done is that, that, that CIC went and, and talked to Canadians. Well, politicians aren't doing that, I'm afraid. Um, mm -hmm. We've also seen huge emphasis on the leaders. And I think that this is a cultural slop over from the US. You know, the, it is the leaders that make the brand of the parties these days. It used to be that the, the parties branded the leaders. Um, that's not the case anymore. And with this has become a huge emphasis on the authority of the leader's office. Um, I worked on patriation of the constitution in 1981-82 in for, for, for the task force in London for Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And even then, there was a tremendous difference in the way the two parliaments operated. Um, the, the, the British Parliament is still sort of a purist parliament, if you like, and it's still, uh, it is a collection of independent members. They may, they may and do belong to, to political parties, but there are issues on which uh, the party has no authority of them also, uh, whatsoever. We don't have that in Canada anymore, and we didn't have it then, even uh, even uh, you know 40 years ago. We um, uh, the, the the Canadian Parliament is much more biddable uh, than it should be. Uh, backbench members really have very little role in the whole parliamentary process anymore. It is it is the leader's office that uh, that can, commands and controls everything, uh, and we need to. I think we need to. Um, re-establish the independence of, of parliamentary members and uh, we need to re-establish their relationship with the people in their constituencies, which is one reason why I'm not in favor of uh, proportional representation, if you want to bring that up. Well, I see that it's uh, almost 10 past 11, so we just have a few more minutes left. We will not get to those quick answer questions that I had for you, unfortunately, you. but we've covered much of, uh, of, of what I had also added into the program, but uh, so we will forget about that. And why I like doing these programs um, all, all the time is, is uh, uh, Jamie uh, drops a little note into the uh, chat box saying that um, China remains the number two destination for BC exports, and it's a significant amount and would mm -hmm. impact uh, the economy in British Columbia quite a bit. It just shows you 
if people have a chance to look into the chat area there that um you know you know um there are parts of the country reliant on that trade with with uh with china and we have to tread carefully right as we always do in these relationships uh, mm -hmm. moving forward um so I, I see that we're we're almost uh, finished here, and and I, I I'd like to just take a moment to to well thank also the listeners who have stayed with us today. Uh, this uh, this is um, it's been fascinating to cover so much ground, and and Jonathan, I'd like to thank you uh, for spending the time with us. And as you may know, if you're with CIC Victoria, Jonathan and I and I we're going to we're going to repeat this at a politics in the pub. Where we get to uh, sit with people face to face um, in the in the very near future. So, on on that note, also with our upcoming events, we do have a number of upcoming events here in in Victoria. We're going to be focusing a lot on uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we have three events uh, with uh, with this in mind. One of them will be a, a Zoom event. Um, we have then uh, actually two Zoom events and a, and a politics in the pub, and I. I, I was asked earlier on about uh, the politics in the pub that uh, Jonathan and I will be doing. Uh, we had set out to do that on the 13th of September, but that's when BC is rolling out the new vaccine passports. And we didn't want to have any kind of issues if things didn't go well. So we have uh, moved that PIP to the 27th of uh, September, and we'll be advertising that, that very shortly. So um, for those of you that had thought it was on the 13th, I apologize for that, but we had to make a last minute decision to move it um, uh, to another date. So um, we, we, have, uh, we have this, uh, as I said, a very, very good uh, program coming up. And if you're not a member of CIC Victoria, please, uh, please check us out. And we would love to see you at uh, one of our events. And don't forget to check out Open Canada, which is our online digital magazine run by Michael Petro as well. So Jonathan, on, on that note, a, a final word as we say goodbye? No, well, I, I, you know, I, this has been a great rehearsal for uh, politics in the pub, and uh, uh, we will have all the rough edges uh, sanded off by uh, the next time we do this. We, we may even take the show on the road. Well, Good. also, um, one of the reasons, uh, a good reason to postpone it was the fact that we will know the results that we should, I should say, yeah. know the results yeah. of the election uh, when we next meet again. And this will, um, this will certainly uh, color our discussions, if you like, yeah. and uh, uh, allow us to think about how we take foreign policy by Canadians forward in support of our CIC National Office and, and Ben Rosewell as it well. It used to be uh, in the 1960s when this was the CIIA, uh, Canadian Institute of International Affairs, that they had a week-long conference every year. Uh, and it was uh, de rigueur for uh, the, the foreign minister or minister of external affairs of the time to spend the whole week there and listen to uh, uh, CIC members um, uh, tell them, uh, telling them what, uh, what we ought to do. In fact, it was the CIC, CIIA that really laid the groundwork for the... Uh, diplomatic relations with uh, People's Republic of China in 1970. Mm. So we have work to do still. We definitely do. And we'll let's meet for coffee and we'll get right on that. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us this, this morning. Again, thank you, Jonathan. And I hope to see you soon at one of our in-person events. Take care and have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye.